Hello, hello. Um, okay, so we got another in the lineup of L2 MEV talks, which is pretty cool. I'm very excited because Ed just gave you all some great um, context. That means that I can move a little faster, so that's very exciting. Um, I want to talk a little bit today, guys. First of all, I'm Ben from Optimism. I want to talk a little bit to you all today about the state of L2 with regards to MEV. So I'm going to talk a little more broadly. I'm not going to talk about maybe as many specifics as Ed does because we have a lot of unknowns and we have a lot of problems ahead and we have a lot of exciting things ahead. Um, so we've got to talk about all that stuff and that's what we're going to do today. Okay, um, look at that cool graphic. Don't you like that graphic? Oh, so pretty. Okay, I want to start with a brief aside just because I know we have some amazing MEV people here. If you are working on sequencing challenges and if you are working on the ETH2 merge API, please check out the Optimism Bedrock code base. This is the coolest damn code base for sequencing designs and especially as they apply to ETH2 and cross-domain stuff that you have ever seen. So please check it out. We basically have this new beautiful abstraction called the block derivation function, which takes in a list of L1 blocks and basically outputs a list of L2 blocks. And so this is very, 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 very useful because it makes constructing different sequencing designs a whole lot easier. So that's super cool and we're super excited about that. So check it out. There's a link in the slides. That will open the door to all sorts of new fun sequencing stuff. This is the most interesting graphic I could find when I Googled like permutation or ordering. I have no idea what it means, but I thought it looked cool. Um, okay, and again, another really big thing that we're doing here with um, Bedrock is we are reusing the ETH2 API. So if you are working on uh, MEV stuff for ETH2, all of that is going to be able to work on Optimism with very low overhead, right? This is a part of our whole EVM equivalent strategy, so that's a big deal. So if you're doing that, I also really encourage you to check it out. Okay, cool. Oh, look at that. See, it's funny, when you get emojis on a different, um, on a different uh, thing, anyway, this looks different than my Mac. I'm looking at this like, what the heck is that? Okay, so now let's get into the actual meat of this talk. So it has been about two years now since we put out this post called MEV Auction. And a lot has changed since then, but looking back, this was a pretty cool deal. The first thing that this did was it introduced sequencing, right? So now that seems like a very commonplace thing, but two years ago, it was not. And you got a great rundown of, um, from Ed on what that is, so I'm really glad to not have to go over that. But the other thing that it talked about was the idea of an MEV auction. The idea that the ability to sequence should be sold by the protocol so that we can have a me measure and a redistribution of the MEV that's being extracted. So if you have MEV uh, that is just being extracted by a miner and the miner gets all of it, this is not nearly as good as if you're requiring the miner to pay for the right to be in that position because now they're competing on a margin and a lot of the MEV can be redistributed. So that is super, super important. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of those implications there later. But I just wanted to reflect on what MEV and L2 has happened in the last two years. So what's been going on since this came out? Well, one of the things that happened was that Flashbots stole our damn name, right? There's a horrible name collision between MEV auction and Flashbots auction. Okay, not really horrible, not really horrible. I love the Flashbots people. But it is important to um, say that these are two different things, right? So when you see a Flashbot auction or the MEV auction that we see on L1 today, this is basically someone who is going to have the ordering rights reselling the ordering rights based on the preferences of some actors in the system. So that is different from an MEV auction as we originally talked about it here and as Optimism will push forward on, which is all about um, selling the right to become a sequencer and redistributing the profits that they're gonna be able to extract. Okay, so that's one thing that's happened is Flashbots has exploded. I don't know what percentage of the hash rate it is now, but I know it's like 90% or something like that, right? Another thing that's happened is that MEV, people have started to hate MEV. I don't know if you all noticed. I mean, that's a funny thing to say in this crowd because I know we all are very interested in it. But the sandwiches came along and really changed the game, right? Before, we had saw a lot of MEV that looked a lot like arbitrage and different things. And now we see people getting upset that they were put in the, in the meat of a, of a TX sandwich and getting very upset. And then, of course, the other thing that's happened is pretty much everyone has started sequencing. All the L2s are sequencing. We have a bunch of sequencing projects that are actually being built into L1 now, which is really, really interesting as well. Um, and so that's been a real Cambrian explosion and really cool to see. Okay, so in general, let me just talk about what, how, how Optimism looks at MEV and what we want to do about it, okay? 
The first thing that we need to do, obviously, is prevent what MEV we can, right? What that means is a little tricky, right? But there's definitely heuristics for bad types of MEV that we can get around that we should do so, right? And Ed talked about uh, an approach on that, which I'll touch on later, um, and there's others as well. And um, the other thing that we think is just as important and perhaps more important is what we can't get rid of in the MEV landscape. We must, one, democratize the ability to extract that, and two, we must extract it not to the people that are searching, but to the protocol itself. This is really, really important, one, for protocol security, um, and two, because we want fee revenue to go to the right places. So the last thing that we're going to do is we're going to take that extracted, that protocol revenue. And remember, MEV is unavoidable. Even fees are technically MEV, right? So it's not going to go away. And we must redirect that protocol revenue towards some source. So Optimism spends a lot of time talking about retroactive public goods funding. And it's our belief that L2 is a unique opportunity to start directing the funding of uh, the revenue of protocols to the right places and not just to a big set of miners running huge warehouses or validators running um, you know, exchanges. And I just want to call out that I think this, I predict that this will start to become the great political debate of protocols as, as we push forward. What do protocols do with the revenue that they generate? This is going to be an extremely, I, frankly, I think contentious topic, I would guess. And it's something that's extremely important to us. And it seems like the biggest uh, sort of political long-term uh, factor that is going to be a huge point of the discussion. And we can't screw it up. So that's a big deal. Fun public goods, yay. Profit. What's that? No, of course not. Uh, uh, well, uh, 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 and of course, we think that most people that are nonprofit today should be for profit. But that's a separate, that's a separate one. That's a separate one. If we do all that now, we'll never get through. OK. OK, so what hasn't changed in the past two years? One thing is that MEV has not suddenly become solved or disappeared. MEV is still fundamental, right? I mean, this is trivial to say, even with the existence of transaction fees. But it's going to go beyond that, and there's going to be other sources as well. The other thing that hasn't changed is fairness is still not universal, right? You show me one person that thinks the protocol is fair, and I'll show you another person that doesn't, right? So that's going to be a challenge. Look, this is a, you know, I like saying spicy things, so I'll say it in that spicy way. This does not mean that heuristics aren't useful. But, and clearly there are things that we should try to agree on are much less fair. Sandwiching is one example. But especially at the protocol level, as opposed to the application level, a universal definition of fairness is going to continue to be hard to seek. The last thing that I'll call out is that honesty assumptions are still dubious. And especially ones where, uh, you know, as opposed to a rationality assumption, these things are going to get tricky. And I want to point you all, OK, honestly, when I wrote this slide, I, I, I wanted to point you all to MEV What Do. This is an incredible, incredible, hugely important blog post um, by Phil. And honestly, he gave MEV What Do Next as a talk this morning. So if you all were not in dark mode this morning, actually, I think I would probably replace this slide with that talk, because that's like kind of like an updated version of this. Um, but this is kind of what's been going on from our perspective uh, that hasn't changed in L2. OK, but obviously, some things are different. Some things have changed. Probably the biggest one is that since we wrote that post, L2s and sequencers are now in prod, pretty much en masse. We have a ton of L2 protocols that are doing this. And the rise of cross-domain MEV is something that's come into the discussion as a result. So um, if you guys didn't see Alex's talk um, earlier from the Flashbots team, uh, definitely go check that out or check out their paper where this uh, image is from. But it's very important to call out that the existence of cross-domain MEV is a market pressure, like many th things related to MEV, towards centralization. And in fact, differences in uh, ordering between domains is also a source of MEV. So this is another reason that we may say that uh, MEV is not going away. And so we must react to this, right? This is definitely, like, I don't know if you guys have been here all day or in the dark mode room, but I've been scared sitting at some of the talks in the dark mode room thinking that we, because we must react to this, right? There are, that we do not want to go into a world where the optimal path forward looks like centralization and is incentivized towards centralization and, and becomes centralization, and then uh, the problems with centralization arise. So that is really important not to have happen. OK, another thing that's happened, and we got a great overview of um, one of the fair sequencing models from Ed just now, is the rise of fair sequencing. And I do want to be clear, this is some extremely, extremely important research. I will say, though, that it is also very early. 
And along with being important, I think it is contentious and will continue to get more contentious. But effectively what we're doing here, right, I'm, I'm glad that I don't have to explain this in as much detail, is we're distributing the ordering, right? We're taking now a set of parties, we're having them all give an order, and we are combining them into one sort of ordering based on that set. So one meme that I think is important to dispel that I've sort of heard is like an optimism is going to do this MIVA thing, and other people are going to do fair sequencing, and you have to sort of choose between these two. And that's not the case, right? Fair sequencing is a good way to reduce some classes of MEV. But the two are not incompatible. And really what you're doing when you do these fair sequencing protocols is you are shifting the problem of sequencing at one centralized party to the edges. But individually, the problems are still going to exist at those edges. And the last thing that we're doing that Ed also touched upon is that we're going to start getting governance involved. And believe me, I think this has the potential to get really, really hairy. Fair sequencing protocols rely on an honesty assumption, which is not possible to distinguish, certainly in the protocol, but I think even in many cases off, out of the protocol, um, from, from malicious. You can't really distinguish an adversary from someone who's got some weird networking going on. And so the introduction of governance is a new thing for L2, right, relatively speaking, because in general, what we want to do with L2s are work towards governance-minimized systems. And so it is definitely the case that uh, including fair sequencing in the mix will make the sequencing become a big part of L2 governance, and it's really important to keep that in mind um, as we go forward. Okay, switching gears a little bit, though. Another really interesting thing that has come about, which we were not aware of, I think, when we wrote this, is that MEV searching has a lot of potential to solve problems within the parallelization space. And so this is really, really, really interesting. Basically, if you guys are familiar with the sort of Flashbots DOS problem, where you have a bundle that pays to the Coinbase at the very end of the transaction, and uh, you want, and you, you know, you basically want to find the set of transactions that satisfy that condition being met, but you can't find it out until the end, and it's this DOS vulnerability. So we have all this work being used to solve for it. It turns out that that problem is almost the exact same problem that we see in parallelism. So imagine you want to take, a, you have a huge set of transactions, and you want to find an ordering for them and a set of those transactions so that you can take chunks of those transactions, run them in parallel, and know that they don't touch each other. This is a really powerful thing because it lets you increase the throughput of your system, and that's really, really, really useful. And uh, the reality is that, that pr the problem statement of finding those is the exact same problem as the MEV sort of Coinbase DOS issue. So that's really, really, really interesting and really cool. And I, ha I linked here in the slides a talk on this that I gave um, last year. So this is something that we definitely did not realize. Um, and I want to make one other comment on the parallelism. We are very bullish at optimism on parallelism in general. And one thing that we frequently see is there's been some analyses that basically look at the Ethereum chain and say, OK, if we attempt to parallelize the Ethereum chain, how much faster will it get? And the number is like 40% faster or something like this. Thanks for the time check. I love that sign. It says I ha we've had enough. So one thing that I want to say is the reason that you only see 40% when you try to parallelize the existing Ethereum chain is because the market for gas on Ethereum is built as if it is single-threaded. And so gas markets are very hard to change on L1 because these markets are incredibly slow. But you can imagine a world in which adding a transaction has basically zero gas price if it starts using a new thread that isn't being used by anyone else. And you should be charging less for that. And so that 40% decrease, um, that comes from par or decrease that comes from parallelization really should be like a 10 a 5% if people on the chain were being correctly charged. So if we just look backwards at the history of the, the Ethereum chain, we can't actually say what parallelism increases will really come from that, and they will look much lower. Because if you don't charge people based on parallelism, they're not going to use it like it's parallel. OK, so uh, a, few th a few fun things to end on. What will the future hold? So definitely it's the case we, don't, we think that these MEV search networks are probably going to go recursive and start finding parallelism. So that's very exciting. There's some trade-offs I'll talk about at the end. Uh, but another thing that's, of course, going to happen is we're going to start going to see the rise of what are effectively going to be political parties associated with monitoring MEV and the fair sequencing services that are being provided. So this is something that's really, really, really interesting. And I don't think it's as simple as just saying the community is going to talk about it. The, uh, the checks and balances on sequencing in systems are, is in itself an extremely political thing. And there will be literal, I think, political parties 
that will exist talking about this. And so it's really important that we start thinking about that now and trying to figure out how we can do this, right? So, you know, one interesting thing also that I think we'll see from this is like political sabotage. So sure, you can try to see if somebody else is getting, uh, is, you know, like broadcasting a large number of sandwiches, but what if their political opponent starts sending transactions to different sequencers in different orders so that it looks like one party is sandwiching you? Right? So, uh, you know, th this is going to be a serious topic of political contention. I don't think it's just going to be as easy as the community sits down and talks about it and figures it out, right? There's going to be a lot going on there. Um, does anyone watch Westworld? Okay, I will say all, everything but the first season sucked, but I will say that in the last season they tried to do something really cool, which was create this super AI that had basically dominated all of the um, like global financial markets and become this super intelligent being. And so maybe what we'll see in the future is that uh, you know, MEV will lead to this, and the searchers are really building the, the intelligence, the singularity. Okay, so parting thoughts. There's a massive trade-off ahead of us. One thing that I even talk about is if we do fair sequencing and it increases latency, does that actually mean that the properties of these transactions that we have to post have to have allow for larger slippage, slippage bounds so that even though it's harder to do uh, manipulation on the order, you can actually make more if it happens. Another one is when should we use cryptography and economics, right? When should we do the threshold encryption stuff? When should we do the fair sequencing? What does it mean when we combine them? And another one is going to be this parallelism efficiency trade-off, right? Because if we can say, right, that we're going to 10x the throughput of the chain by having MEV searchers search for it, but if we also say we want fair sequencing when we want to limit that, that's a trade-off, right? So maybe it's going to end up being a choice that app-specific chains or other chains make is, are we going to go more efficient and get more parallel throughput, or are we going to have fair sequencing, right? Really interesting question. And the big, 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 big question that, it, that is definitely had is how are we going to govern these sequencing rules, right? I can't emphasize enough that this isn't going to be clear. And at Optimism, we do think that this is probably going to be a good chase for, place for on-chain governance, but there will be huge, huge aspects of off-chain governance that influence this, and huge, huge, huge political stuff. And in general, what we do with the revenue on these domains, I really, really do believe will end up being one of the great political debates within the choice of domains, right? We're entering a multi-domain ecosystem. We're so early that the competition between these ecosystems doesn't maybe look how it will in the long term. I think that, uh, whoops, I think that revenue distribution and what happens to that is going to be one of those politicized things. Um, okay, that's all I got for y'all. As always, we're hiring. Go check out our stack. If you're building any of these stuff, with, uh, if you want to move to L2, you can do it with all your L1 stuff. And uh, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>